Bible, not yet. Bible study. <laughs> Bible study. I love the word. Bible study. I go to a lot of them. I want to speak to you tonight about the most important thing in the world. About the most important thing in your life. The grace of God. I'm telling you what, brothers and sisters, we would be nowhere without it. We're going to Titus chapter 2, and we will screen it for, for you and for me, since I can't read the Bible. I thank Brother Glenn for offering his apple, uh, the, the whatever it is, But we're going to have four verses. We're only going to look at four verses tonight. The most important thing in the world in four verses, 73 words. Boy, that's some tough stuff right there. Titus. I love Titus. Titus was Paul's lieutenant. This guy had such bearing... Paul won him to Christ. This Greek, Titus, walked into Jerusalem with Paul. Evidently, he had such bearing about himself. Ah, just, you know those people that walk into the room and everybody goes, who is that? Titus must have been that type of character because when he went to Jerusalem, nobody questioned that he wasn't circumcised. You know, Paul had circumcised Timothy so they'd be able to get into the synagogues. Couldn't bring anybody into a synagogue that wasn't circumcised, so for that purpose. Titus could carry himself so well as a Christian convert that nobody even seems to have considered it, questioning him being circumcised. Now, isn't that an interesting character? I love the man because all of us Gentiles ever since are not questioned about circumcision. Titus is our man. I love him. Paul sent him on the worst missions to the worst places. There's one line that says, and Titus went to Dalmatia. That's Yugoslavia today. You didn't want to go to Dalmatia, okay, with a Christian message. And who did Paul send? Titus. Titus went there. Crete was falling apart. They had ministered there. Titus was on three or four, two, the third, fourth, missionary journeys, and half of another one. He went with Paul. He was reliable. He was, he had, what did it, gravitas? And there they used to talk about the gravitas, bearing. He just, and he knew what he was doing. And Paul has this problem in Crete. You know what the Cretans, they're, Lazy, gluttons, liars, and all of these things are in that, in that letter to Titus. This is one of the pastoral letters. And in Crete, Paul sends this letter. This is late in Paul's ministry. We're talking 62, 64 B.C., 25 years after the cross. I like that <laughs> because this is fresh. This is the gospel message in all of its freshness, it's new, it's crisp, it's new. But better than that, this is at the end of Paul's ministry. Paul said, I'm an old man to Timothy. At the same time, he's writing these, these other prison, these pastoral uh, uh, epistles. He said, I'm an old man. So Paul has had his adult life coming to grips with the gospel, 
and sharing the gospel in multitudes of cultures and to people. He has, he has over and over and over again shared the gospel. But now he's writing to his lieutenant Titus. And Titus knows the gospel. All right? We've already established that he's on it. He, he's, he's number one. He's the guy you can count on. He knows what he's doing. And he's going to Crete. You go to Crete and get those churches straightened out there. He goes. Let me tell you one last thing. When the Muslim hordes in the 600s were crossing out of Arabia and the Middle East and going across North Africa and going across into Europe, looting, killing, raping, enslaving by the thousands, they closed in on Crete, 600. Titus has been dead many years. They buried his bones there. The Muslims halted their invasion so the Christians could dig up his bones and carry them out of this, con uh, this land that was being, was being overrun with Muslims. They let them carry Titus' bones out, and they took him to Venice. This is 600. This is, this is 550 years after the fact of what we're looking at today. But Titus, 600 years later, still had that respect that the Muslims would stop what they were doing, and they didn't stop for anything, and let the Christians carry those bones to Venice before that land was conquered. I, I tell you, I, I love Titus. I love him. Centuries later, they brought his bones back to Crete, and allegedly, that's where they lie today, in a chapel. He loved Crete, and he built this church up. And in this letter, Paul is condensing Theology. I, I wanted to get a picture of a theology library. <laughs> yeah, you've been to the college library. You've been to a college library. But a theological library, uh, just as far as you can see, thick volumes of books covering every intricate detail of the faith. This is Paul, late in life. He is a theological library. And these things have been working over in his head. And he's been delivering them in multiple cultures. And here to Titus, he doesn't have to go into all the details, so he condenses it. We talk about today sound bites. A sound bite. That's what Titus is. It's sound bite after sound bite. I love it. I love the book. This is my opportunity to teach from Titus that I've wanted to do for a long time. So excuse me if I'm a little overexcited. But these are sound bites, and they come very quick. And they're theological sound. Uh, perfect doctrine. Coming just like that in this short letter, condensed letter. And he tells about what we need to do to get a church organized. And I like the one about the deacon's wives shouldn't be drinking too much wine. That's in there. And he tells about the position of the elders, the episkopos, the bishops, the leaders of the churches, how to find them, what to look for, what their character needs to be. Men, that doesn't change. Our character should be just like the elders and the deacons that's given in Scripture. All men should work toward that position, that, that attitude, that thought of mind. So Paul goes through these things of how you build the church, what you need to do specifically in Crete. Rebuke them sternly. <laughs> We've got that now. So we can use that in the church, amen? Well, let's do it with some intelligence. But he goes through all of that, and then he says, for 
all the reason of church organization and discipline and rules and regulations, if you would have it. All of what the church is to be about comes down to this. Four. The grace of God bringeth that bringeth salvation. Bring, bring, bringeth. Bringing. You understand verbs? Bringing means it keeps coming. Bringing. Bringing salvation. It keeps coming. From Paul and Titus's day, it keeps coming down to us. And on into the future it rolls, bringing salvation to the grace of God. Before I get too far here, let's get that up there. That is number one. I apologize for our crudity and my reliance on Alpha's little stapler. But that's number one. Aren't you glad? You just go right ahead and back up there. There we go. The grace of God, Paul says, in the power of the Holy Spirit, that bringeth salvation, always rolling. Now, in the same period of time to 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul talks about this. And he says, this salvation was before the foundation of the world. Hallelujah. God knew what he was doing. Amen. With this salvation he brought to us. How did it come? Bringing salvation got really serious. We just went through the Christmas season where we rehearsed for a month. Has a fixed point in time has appeared. Well, who was that that appeared? We just celebrated his birthday, didn't we? His appearance we've been celebrating for a month. The grace of God bringing salvation has appeared, it says, to all men, to all people. The first appearance of Jesus Christ brought about the completion and the revelation of the salvation of the grace of God from the foundation of the earth, of the universe, of the cosmos. God has only this forward, keeps it coming. It rolls on towards us. All men, next, next verse. Remember, we're only working with four verses here tonight. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in our present age. I told you this was the most important message you could have. The grace of God bringing salvation does what? It's teaching us. Do I not? I don't have to explain to you that that's grace, do I? Some, some, some translations say training us, teaching us, six or one, half a dozen of the other. The 
grace of God, bringing salvation to the one who has appeared, is teaching us. Teaching is not a fixed word like has, point in time. Teaching is over and over and over. I need it. I need it over and over and over again. Anybody got it the first time? Anybody got all of it the first time? Anybody growing as you stay with it? Amen? The teaching keeps coming. It keeps rolling on and on. A negative. It teaches the negatives. This is a negative. Teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. Titus is the only letter book that this term appears in. Worldly lusts. Denying ungodliness. Ungodliness is that attitude that is at war with God. Ungodliness is that attitude and lifestyle that doesn't need God. Deny ungodliness in our lives. That's what the grace of God is teaching us. Deny ungodliness. Don't go there. Why should we? We've already... We've already studied. We've already been born again. We're on that rolling continuum of bringing salvation. Keeps coming, keeps helping, keeps teaching, keeps training. Deny ungodliness and worldly lust. When Paul, this is the only place this, this, this term appears. When Paul talked about worldliness, it was they wanted to follow different leaders, you know, some follow Apollos, some. Paul said it was worldly. He said, you rich people don't want the poor people to come in and sit at my feet. <laughs> That's worldliness right there. Huh? Well, the, the historical church, the seven deadly sins, the historical church, the medieval church, come up with seven deadly sins. I think pretty much picture what, what this worldly lust is all about. Hmm. Read them aloud with me. We'll start at one, and that is lust, gluttony, greed, sloth. Well, I'm after the medieval period, and I would put pride first. Amen? That's, maybe, that, maybe they got that as the foundation with the tree on top of it. I don't know. But pride is the worst. Pride is the worst. When you talk about worldly lusts and seven deadly sins that the historical church was uh, interested in, you see what we're talking. You understand what we're talking about. Amen? that worldliness, that fleshliness, we must deny. Three positives. Three positives that the grace of God bringing salvation is teaching us. Let's move them over a little bit. The pluses. I believe it says soberly. Right? Live soberly. I didn't. Modern translations just go ahead and say self-controlled. Live self-controlled. Soberly means self. We think sober, that means not drinking to the point of drunkenness, right? That's a good idea, too. Don't do that. And I looked up soberly, and I kind of liked it. And I kind of had to write it out in big letters so I can read it. Very briefly, let me say, soberly, serious. I have trouble with that because I like to clown around a little bit too much. But I need to be serious. 
sensible, soberly sensible, self-restraint. That's kind of where self-controlled comes in. Goes on to say, with moderation. Boy, that's a beautiful word we need to teach, moderation. And again, self-restraint. So that's what the grace of God bringing salvation is teaching us these positives. Live. Live. Self-controlled. Righteously. What does that mean? Righteously. Some say upright. Translate upright. That means when you take your Bible and you look through it, and you read those standards of God given us in the Bible. Isn't that a wonderful gift? You read the standards of God. That's what righteously is. Living by those standards. Respecting those standards. Praying to God He reveal the standards to you that are getting you in the negatives here. Living by the standards given by God as close as you can, righteously, godly, Ooh, godly. What does that mean? Well, Paul uses it repeatedly, and Peter does too, and I'll sum it up for you real quick. Godly means knowledge of truth and knowledge of God. I kind of like that, don't you? When you talk about living godly, you're talking about living by the truth. You're talking about living, looking to God. I really like that. And we're being taught that. Well, the grace of God bringing salvation, teaching us, does something else. Is that the next verse? No, 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 no. that's this one. Looking. Some translate waiting. Yeah. And I, if you're waiting and looking, you're being focused. Amen? <laughs> you're being focused. We're to be focused. Looking and waiting for that blessed hope. And the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Didn't I tell you that he had condensed this down pretty good? Wow. <laughs> Teach me, O oh grace of God. Focus me. Get me in focus. It should be apparent as these go up. Us. Us, all people, all men, us, us. Now, I added it here. It's not, it's not in that. But it is here. All people. Praise God that the grace of God has appeared to all people. Amen. Many deny it, don't they? If they don't deny it by just outright uh, enmity, they deny it by not having any of the rest of these things of a concern to them. So he is focusing us on what? Now I'm going to differ a little bit from orthodox teaching by introducing blessed hope. This would be uh, Titus 1, 2. Titus 1, 2. Are you focused on the blessed hope? Titus 1, 2. Also in Titus 3, it says these words. The hope of eternal life. God cannot lie. Don't you like that? Promised. 
promised before time began. Every, I, I, I've, I've done this for years. If you go and look up hope in the Bible, you'll finally get to this definition. Like I say, Paul is crisp, tight, sound biting, uh, putting these things together quickly. Uh, to a guy who understands what you're talking about. <laughs> hey, man, uh, uh, mano a mano with, with a, a, a trusted lieutenant, a, a, a great man. And he says, we are to be focusing on the blessed hope. Now, immediately after that, it says, and the coming of the Lord Jesus, right? But the blessed hope. If we take what Paul has put up here, that hope should be followed by eternal life. Do you understand that? The whole Bible is about that. When we talk about hope, we're talking about eternal life. The hope of eternal life. That inspires us. That's what we're to be focused on. Our eternal life. A man died. Roger Durbin. Roger Durbin believed in Jesus Christ. He had received the grace of God bringing salvation. He'd been taught all his life. He was focused on it very intently at the end. The hope of eternal life. That's where we want to be focused. Because eternal life exists in a person, the person who appeared. Uh -oh. Don't stick on that. Well. Bud, where are you at? Uh, no. <laughs> you keep your seat. You keep your seat, bud. <laughs> Just run out of board, didn't I? So we're going to come over here. And add to our board, focus, looking, waiting, waiting, looking, focused on that eternal life that we have. When we became born again, uh, the way I see it, we stepped onto an escalator. You ever ride an escalator? And we're going up. We are already in eternal life. Amen? At the top of the escalator is a bead curtain. You ever go through a bead curtain? That's death. We are eternal right now. Riding the escalator of eternal life to a bead curtain of death. When we step through, hallelujah, glory to God, the blessed hope of eternal life becomes very real to us. Amen? And who do we have to thank for it? Jesus Christ. He is a personification of the grace of God, bringing salvation, appearing to all men as we celebrate, teaching us. How's that clock doing back there? 20 minutes to go? 20 till. 20 till, okay. Okay. Focusing us waiting, looking for the blessed hope of eternal life. We're already there. Amen. And the appearing of Jesus Christ. That's the second appearing. He appeared. He has appeared. Fixed in time. We say 2,000 years ago. He has appeared. Boom. Has. It's done. It's over. Appeared. Now we're in this phase. Amen. We're waiting. We're watching. We got eternal life gobbling us up. <laughs> Hallelujah. And this is going to culminate as his second appearance. I want you to notice there is no intermediary appearance. Amen. There's no secret rapture being revealed in this condensation of Scripture. There is the appearance number one. Glory to God. And he's been teaching us and focusing us ever since. 
And there's a second coming, the appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ in glory, in judgment, resurrection of the living, of the dead, of the, uh, the, the wicked and the righteous together, and then the judgment. Two appearances. One has happened. The other, we're looking, we're waiting, we're focused on the next appearance of Jesus Christ. Thank you for your patience. We're going to need another board, aren't we? Uh, remember, this is only four verses we're dealing with here. He's got it condensed down pretty good, doesn't he? And probably we better get another one of these. Oh boy, put that, put that last verse up there, number 14. 14. Give me a little room there for my clamp. If we lean a little bit, that line in that in that verse. Uh, go back one. Go back one. Our great God. I missed that. I apologize. I got the. Might be a different translation. But this one says, Our great God. Hallelujah. And Savior, Jesus Christ. This is one of the most distinctive lines in Scripture that Jesus Christ is God. And that's what John says. Look on my Facebook page, it's right underneath my picture. Jesus is God. Period. The grace of God personified, bringing salvation, appearing, teaching, focusing us on His coming again and our eternal life. The great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. If I had a good hip, I'd hit the floor. <laughs> it's that good. It's that good. What about him? What about this Jesus Christ? Oh boy, I like this. Bud, don't put your hand behind here because these staples come through. Understand verb tenses? It's done. <laughs> it's over. It's fixed. Has gave. You know what he did. You know the story, amen. You know, we sang it. How does, how does it work out that the music lines up with a message without anybody ever saying anything? He gave himself. What is this? <laughs> Us. Us. Now, when we're saying us here in the context with Paul and Titus, it means the church, okay? The born again church of Jesus Christ. Us. Oops. I love you. I love you, us's. <laughs> I love you, us's. Why did he do that? Jesus, why did you go to all this trouble? Remember that us's? I'm not done with the us's. Number one. 73 words. We're just outlining four verses. The great God, our Savior, Jesus Christ, He gave Himself for us. Number one. He might redeem. Redeem us? From what? Do you need redemption? Boy, do I need redemption. He might redeem us. From how much iniquity? From how much lawlessness? That's another translation of that Greek word. How much lawlessness is he redeeming us from? All of it. 
my Savior. I have nothing he can't redeem. And you do too. And the, the lockup in the, in the worst prison. All iniquity. Redeemed by the mighty blood of Jesus Christ. Who just happens to be the great God. And our Savior Jesus Christ. He gave himself for us. That one, he might redeem us from all iniquity. I don't think I'm ready to go yet. We got this matter of sanctification. Do you like sanctification? Uh huh. This Jesus. Does he know what he's working with? Huh? Does, does he know what he got himself in for? Yeah, he does. Not only me, all people. There's only one can do that. Only the great God can do that. What's he up to? Peculiar people. He's looking for peculiar people. Don't all raise your hand at once. <laughs> I've been to Peculiar, Missouri. Great truck stop there. Spending many a night there. Peculiar people. Other translations say uh, people for his own possession. Get it straight. He wants us. Understand that? Did he go to some trouble? He wants me. Good God Almighty. He wants you. Dear Lord. Some of you, I don't know, you know. No. I know he can work this out. These people purifying a people for his own possession. Are we the possession of Jesus? Hmm. I'll put it another way. Are we possessed by Jesus? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. Amen. Uh, something happens then. What's he doing this for? What's he about? What, they, what, what is he about? And these peculiar people he's rounding up. Oh, no, Alpha. She, she gave me extra staples, but I'll use her packing tape. Yes, that's what it says up there, isn't it? On our scripture. Friends. I cannot, I cannot lie. If there's no zealousness for good works in your heart, in your life, in your lifestyle, I really have to question. Or better, keep teaching. <laughs> Bringing salvation and keep teaching by the power of the Holy Spirit that these things be accomplished in each one of our lives. Great God, our Savior, given himself for us, all of it coming together. This is what he wants. Zealous for good works. I know some of you are. <laughs> I work with you, and I love you for it. Zealous for good works. Poor Bob Tebow was just about wore out. Cutting wood for, for Farron down at to Rollo for that it's his birthday and all that stuff and, and cutting that wood and stuff and then driving back. And I had a request into him, hey, we don't have a guitar picker for nursing home service on Wednesday morning. Oh, man, he said, I don't know. I got a lot of stuff. A lot of issues going on. I don't know. I don't know. I'll let you know. I'll let you know later. Got the message this morning. said, I'll be there. <laughs> the man is zealous for good works. And, man, he did some good works up there today. Good work. So, how many good works are there? 
We've got to close quick, don't we? Huh, well, good works. What are they? What are they? What are they? God has made this world as an opportunity for good works. Remember that scripture? I should have looked it up, shouldn't I? The whole world is held together by God doing all of these things. The, the wickedness, the meanness that's out there creates an opportunity for infinite good works. We're without excuse. I, I don't care. I'm not going to tell you what one good work, two good works, two, what these top good works are. No, They're all good. Amen? They're all good. Boy, I've seen some of you, and I know you're zealous for good works, and I love you for it. And I am too, which just goes to tell me the grace of God has fallen on my life. And I pray God, He's fallen on you. And what I just told you tonight is the most important thing in the world. And the most important thing in your life. No excuses, no apologies. No shaving it. That's it. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for a guy like Titus who can receive this message and know exactly what's going on. And now we do. Amen? You got it? Okay, let's, let's leave here singing. 232. 232. Marvelous grace. Look at that. I just did this whole thing without a cane. Can you praise God? <laughs> Can you praise God? 232.